Hello again. <laughs> uh, okay. So, a duty to encourage, a duty to advance. Institutional collections and society of antiquaries in the 19th century. Uh, to begin with, I do have to start with a caveat. I'm afraid if you read the abstract uh, in the printout, this probably res uh, resembles nothing to do with that. So, I apologise in advance. So, despite our present surroundings, the Society of Antiquaries Library began in a very modest vein. As we can see from the minutes taken from the first official council meeting at the Mitre Tavern, they merely required a humble box to lay up the books in. It was only after they had found permanent lodgings at Chancery Lane that they acquired a large room for the immediate reception of books and objects. And it was then that they received their first substantial request. Now this request came from Bishop Charles Littleton, uh, the figure you can see up here, who, upon his death, left the society 90 printed books and a substantial collection of manuscripts. James Mann, who became the society's president in 1949, argued that Littleton's bequest formed the foundation of the collection today. And over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, Sal continued to attract a number of significant gifts, thus causing them to amass the collection that we see today. In this paper, I discuss various aspects of the collection in order to think more broadly about its role in 19th century intellectual culture, and in particular, how the collection itself may have helped to establish the society as an intellectual environment. I'm sure the majority of you here are familiar with the work of Bernard Nurse, and this has proved to be a valuable resource to me in my research, and one I hope to build upon. Now again, as with most speakers here, this paper forms part of a much larger piece of work, my PhD thesis, uh, where I examine a variety of 19th century institutions and their respective collections, and so my second chapter will actually be on the Society of Antiquaries Library. So now, over the course of my research, I have found Willett, Yu and Gladstone's ideas about intellectual culture useful, as they've shown us about how the Victorians think about influence of environment. So Gladstone believed that intellect, like other human agents, depends much on its environment, and through this environment, intellect may be a light for certain veracities and a darkness for others. Uh, he clearly believed he could pull off sideburns as well, but I'm not so sure. So this comment was made in response to the Irish physicist John Tyndall on the issue of home rule in Ireland. And although Gladstone was never a fellow of this society, the idea that one's physical environment and peer group could indeed influence how one thought is pertinent to my discussion today of the society's collection. Therefore, this paper will begin with a brief discussion of the various ways in which Sal's collection was created, stored, and subsequently used in order to think more carefully about the impact this may have had on the society's intellectual culture. How, I ask, did gifts and requests have the potential to shape the thinking of Sal's fellows? And was this reflected more widely in 19th century intellectual circles? So let's begin by thinking a little bit about how these books were stored. So meeting initially at local taverns, and I always imagine some sort of scene like this uh, when I'm thinking about taverns in the uh, 18th century, um, the society struggled to find a space in which to store their possessions. And in 1753, two years after they were granted the Royal Charter, they did eventually move to Robin's Coffee House. And it was here that the society were first provided with somewhere to store their books. Now this modest allocation of space comprised of a large room of the house up two pairs of stairs and was fitted out with shelves and drawers so that the society could house their embryonic collection. Now this coffee house was the first property in which they had the sole and exclusive use of and so thus this enabled them and their collection to grow more quickly. Nevertheless, the space was still far from ideal. The library room itself was located in the antechamber of the resident secretary's apartments and could only be accessed by walking through these apartments. Indeed, in 1773, Richard Gow, the society's director at the time, suggested to the then president, Jeremiah Mills, that the collection would be better off housed elsewhere. Mills evidently agreed, <coughs> remarking, I suppose Mr Norris no longer uses the library as a dressing room, and suggested perhaps it wanted cleaning, painting, and embellishment. <coughs> However, these alterations to the library never actually occurred, as discussions regarding another move began as early as 1776. With the coffee shop as a meeting house, fellows were concerned this might be unsuitable for a society that had been granted a royal charter. 
The Prospect of Society moving began to take shape, and especially after it was announced by Mr Blake that the present Somerset House was to be demolished and rebuilt for public offices. Finally, four years later, the building work was complete, and the keys were handed over to the Society's Vice President. This move to Somerset House meant that Society was awarded with a library that was more fitting of its Royal Charter, and it was the first time they'd been given their own purpose-built library. Not to be outdone by the Royal Society, of course, Sal endeavoured to furnish their new apartments in a way that would be suitable to their royal munificence. And again, according to Richard Gow, these new apartments were magnificent indeed, as he describes them as being furnished with the finest silver-plated candlesticks, inkstands and soft dishes. There were also great chandeliers to light the rooms, however he did also add, I tremble for my pocket in regards to the cost. But despite the Society's attempts at making their Somerset House Library an adequate space for fellows to work, there were still a number of issues with this space. Being situated on the ground floor, the library was subject to noise from the Strand. And there was also poor natural lighting, both of which fellows claimed made it difficult to work there. In addition to this, there was no room for expansion if the collection was to grow any larger and a number of fellows felt the society's lack of space prevented them from carrying out the research effectively. We can see this in the observation of the antiquarian naval scholar Sir Nicholas Harris Nichols, for example, who complained in 1829 that the library room is too confined and too incommodious for the number of valuable books which it contains, and for the members to resort to it generally as a place of study. Therefore, in 1859, the society began negotiations for the move to Burlington House, which was eventually enacted in 1874. Although their new me meeting room was not as light as the apartments in Somerset House, they were provided with a library space which far surpassed their old premises. The then Vice President, in his opening address at Bellington House, declared that, with respect to the library, the gain is infinite. Instead of being obliged to place our books not less than 20,000 in number in several localities, some dark, others hardly accessible, on staircases and in cupboards, I'm not actually sure too much has changed, they are now brought together in one handsome and well-proportioned room, which allows a perfect classification and affords ample space for additions. The architects Banks and Barry ensured that the library was made the focal point of the Society's new apartments, and their designs favoured deep bay windows fitted with shelves and seating. Indeed, if we refer to the floor plans, we can see that the room was 55 by 43 foot, four times larger than their library had been at Somerset House. This additional space provided the society with 3,500 feet of additional shelving, allowed them to store their collection far more adequately than they had before. Therefore, we can see how this last move made the society's library a far more attractive place to work, and with the additional space, it was easier for fellows to access the collection. I do recommend, if you've not been to see the library here at Burlington House upstairs, to go and have a look. It really is very beautiful. So I apologise for that somewhat brief whirlwind tour of the Society's premises thus far, but I do think it's important to understand how this collection has been housed, especially when I think this has had an impact on the development of the collection itself. Although taverns were effective at facilitating discussion and debate, they were entirely unsuited to storing books, and least of all books of any worth. However, when the Society moved to Somerset House and subsequently Burlington House, their purpose-built libraries meant that they could house a much larger collection, and arguably a much finer one. It also afforded the society with the grandeur they so desired, and with their magnificent apartments, grand chandeliers, and silver-plated candlesticks, we can see how they may have used these two libraries as a means to showcase their credentials as a reputable institution. As Susan Pears notes in her essay, The Interpretation of Ancient Objects, the society was a place where fellows could meet, talk, and socialise with like-minded individuals. But it was the library and the space it occupied which provided these men with the intellectual resources to support and inspire them. So let's have a little think now about how the collection was built over the course of the 19th century. So to date, the Society of Antiquaries is in possession of the largest antiquarian library in the country, comprising of more than 130,000 books dating from the 15th century to the present day. Not only does the collection consist of printed works, but it also contains artefacts, manuscripts, prints and drawings spanning all areas of antiquarianism, from architectural history, British and European archaeology and art history, to British local history and decorative arts. 
And although the Library Committee were allocated a small budget in 1859 in which to purchase books, the majority of their collection has been acquired through gifts and donations. So one of the ways in which the society received these donations was through an exchange of publications with other intellectual institutions. They received numerous volumes of publications in this way, including journals, proceedings, bulletins, catalogues, and annual reports, and in return presented copies of their journal, Archaeology. If we look at the list of donations for 1849, for example, we can see how significant this practice was. In this year alone, the society received 213 donations, and 51 of these were from other institutions, including, but not limited to, the Smithsonian Institution, the Art Union of London, Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society, the Royal Irish Academy, the Archaeological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, the Athenaeum, United Service Institution, and uh, last but not least, the Zoological Society of London. As we can see, these publications may not always have been entirely in keeping with the society's interests, but nevertheless, they were accepted and became part of the collection that we do know today. Donations from individuals, and more specifically fellows, were also actively encouraged, and when gifts were presented, they were laid out on the table at committee meetings and the donor's name recorded in the donor book. The most significant period of donations occurs after the society moved to Burlington House perhaps and most likely due to the increase in the shelf space. In 1866, for example, Frederick William Fairholt, the illustrator and engraver, an example of his work here, bequeathed the society his collection on European pageantry, including 179 volumes and a number of prints. This collection was later supplemented by another fellow, the Reverend E.G. Hewitt, who added to the collection from his own library. Two years later, in 1869, the architect Arthur Ashpital, designer of the Wellington Testimonial Clock Tower by London Bridge, again you can see that over there, left the society a substantial number of volumes in his will, including 28 Incunapula, parts of the Elzevia collection, architectural works by Palladio and Varanasi, books on the occult, and 23 chapbooks. In the council minutes for the 2nd of February 1869, there exists the following entry on this request. The late Ashpital has bequeathed to the society his library, or all the books we have not got, and his vases from Italy, and the whole library counted 2,840 volumes. Remember back in 1849, there was only 213 donations for the entire year, so this is quite a significant number. Indeed, there are still a number of finely printed books which constitute some of the rarest works in the society's possession that came from this Ashpital collection. However, by relying on donations, the society was subject to the whims of their donors. And when Augustus Williston Franks became the director of the library in 1859, he was concerned about how the collection was progressing. So Franks considered the library to be one of the most important features in the society's progress. And in 1860, he made the following declaration. The great value of a library from which works can be borrowed to all those who engage in antiquarian pursuits need scarcely be assisted upon. It should contain all standard works of reference in the special subjects of our studies, namely antiquities, history, and art. The space at our disposal being limited, it should be restricted to those or to cognate subjects. At present, being the accumulation of accident rather than design, our library has the most glaring deficiencies. And whilst it may contain many works of great value, it wants others to which our fellows have daily occasion to refer. As we can see from his declaration, Franks is clearly concerned the library has grown too organically and criticised the way in which the collection neglected to cover basic works of reference. Indeed, if we look at accounts of the Society's catalogue or accounts of the Society's library at this time, we can see that there were several surprising omissions, including a lack of Stukeley's works on Stonehenge and Avebury. The Society only had one edition of, Brit of Camden's Britannia, and many series of books were also incomplete. When we compare this to the more active private collections from this time, the majority of these individuals had significantly larger libraries. In 1829, for example, Sir Walter Scott was reported to hold some 20,000 volumes on British history and topography, whereas Sir Richard Colt Hall's library catalogue listed more than 10,000 works on topography, and Richard Heber had acquired 150,000 books by his death in 1833. Therefore, in an attempt to rectify some of these deficiencies, the council allocated Franks a regular sum of money in which to purchase books. 
the council being anxious to remedy in some slight measure these deficiencies, a lot £50 a year to be expended by this library committee, but it was only by the assistance of fellows the library can become as complete as it ought to be. So this note is in one of the council minutes. As we can see, the council was still keen to be presented with donations, but they were also conscious of the fact that the collection needed to be comprehensive in order to be useful to fellows. The society had occasionally purchased works before, and indeed one of their rarest earliest acquisitions was the 1619 petition by Edmund Bolton, a Catholic lawyer and herald, for the establishment of a royal academy. Indeed, they'd also acquired the inventory of King Henry VIII and the 1550 Winchester Doomsday at an auction in 1790 in the same manner. But when thinking about which books to purchase, the society also relied on recommendations made by fellows, and we can see these requests listed in the Library Recommendations book, which spans from 1859 to 1940. In this book, fellows could note down their requests for purchases and then signed alongside the entry their name. Now, you may have noticed that this item is actually on display today and has been put out for today's conference. You can note that it's just here uh, on my right-hand side. I beg of you again to go and have a look at it, as it not only demonstrates the various ways in which fellows interacted with the collection, but it also shows us how they interacted with one another. So when a recommendation was made, other fellows could sign their name alongside the recommendation in order to second or third the request, and on occasion, they even added comments of their own. So in 1882, for example, there's a request for the January report on the old records of the India office by Sir George Birdwood, under which it is noted, useful for reference and as a guide for authentic sources of information. In 1885, W.H. St. John Hope supported a request for Surrey Bells and London Bell Founders, alongside the note, a book of value from many points of view. Whereas a request for George Petrie's The Ecclesial Architecture of Ireland is accompanied by Ruthven's declaration that it is the chief work on round towers. However, fellows were not always in agreement with one another. I know, shock horror. And we can see this in a request made by Charles Spencer Percival. He was a regular contributor to the library recommendations book, and he requests Spellman's Concilia in two volumes. But following this entry is a, a note by W.A. Black where he has added, the society already has Wilkins' David Concilia, full volumes, folio. And this is a much more complete and authentic work. There are other examples of this, including C.K. Roshan's request for the 1866 edition of Histoire de la Porcelaine, in which they read the following comments. And again, you can just about see these uh, on the top right hand side there, and this is the page that's open to over here. Um, <laughs> a very bad book by Ost, A U S T, I'm assuming maybe Augustus Wallace and Franks. Uh, and, but this is a new edition by CKW. And so, as you can see from this dialogue, it demonstrates that the fellows were evidently keen to influence the choice of works purchased. But their recommendations also give an insight into how the collection might have been used. Indeed, these men were renowned for their contributions to the fields of antiquities, and many of them wrote prolifically, publishing their research in books and journals. And as you can see, there are multiple examples of fellows using specific items from the Society's collection for their own research. In 1825, for example, Henry Ellis wrote a letter to request to borrow from the Society's library, Elmham's Life of Henry V, one of Hema's publications stating that it is for the immediate purpose in writing a paper. In 1863, there is an entry in the Council Minutes for July which reads, Mr Black, having stated to the Council that he also would be glad of the loan of some of the Society's manuscripts to illustrate a lecture given by him at Rochester. Therefore, this collection was clearly being actively used by members, and so we can see why they may have had a vested interest in its development. So before I end, I did just want to refer back to that quote by Gladstone, discussed earlier. Intellect, like any other human agents, depends much on its environment. And what I hope to have demonstrated today is that the Society's collection of manuscripts and printed works was, and arguably still is, an essential part of Sal's intellectual identity. As the libraries not only functioned as an environment in which to store books, but they also helped the Society to legitimise their reputation. Furthermore, from the way in which fellows interacted with the collection, whether through presenting gifts, making requests, or just using it for their research, we can see that they were invested in its development. And these interactions, I argue, can be used to provide us with an insight into the intersections between institutional collections and the 19th century intellectual culture more broadly. Thank you.